All right, well, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Craig Bettinson. I know many of you, but not necessarily all of you. I just wanted to um, introduce Tim and Mike a little bit, but also just to give you a little bit, a little bit of background here. Micah joined us three years ago on campus and did a great program for the students at that time. Uh, some follow-up listening sessions along with two of his colleagues who I think are also joining us tonight. But um, Mike has been great with the program and, and great with Northeastern. And it's, it's just good to have you back, Micah. And I know that um, we started these conversations a while ago and brought him into the mix. And so, so here we are. Um, and I was also thrilled as I was looking at the invite or uh, the registration list today to see so many alumni that are, are joining us tonight. So a big shout out to all of them and brought Jim Anderson in as well. So here we are. Uh, Tim, Tim Van Bloem is a uh, music major in the class of 2023, uh, a rising star here at Northeastern. He, he does a lot and he does a lot very well. So uh, on that note, Tim, I'll just, uh, have you take over from here and I'm gonna sit back and enjoy and do my thing behind the scenes. Well, thanks Craig, that was really flattering. I hope you didn't get people's expectations too high. Um, <laughs> but hi everyone, my name is Tim. Like Craig said, I'm a music industry major in my second year here at Northeastern. Uh, I wanna give a big thank you to a few people before we get started. So first of all, Craig and the Northeastern Co-op Department as well as the music department. We really couldn't have had this without you guys, so I really appreciate it. I also wanna give a big shout out to the Songwriting Club here at Northeastern. If you guys are watching this today and you really like what you hear, you should definitely be joining the Songwriting Club. They're available on OrcSync and I think the president is in this call. So Eli, if you wanna drop your email in the chat, feel free to, um, but they have a meeting tomorrow at eight. Micah is a songwriter. He's doing all these amazing things. And if you're excited about that world, it's definitely a cool thing to join. So. Micah is a songwriter who's written hits for Tori Kelly, Selena Gomez, Lady A, and more, just to name a few. We'll be starting this Q&A with a lot of the questions that you guys sent in, but please continue to ask questions throughout the session. Towards the end, you're gonna have the opportunity to ask questions to Micah yourself. And if you want, you can unmute when, you're, when Angelica lets you and you'll be able to talk to him. So with that, I'm gonna say a big thank you to Micah Premnath for joining us today. Micah, how are you today? I'm good, man. How are you doing? I am very excited, honestly. So yeah, for anyone same. wondering, can you tell us a little about what you do? Uh, yeah, I am a songwriter. I'm based out of LA right now. Um, I go between LA and, and Nashville. Um, I, I produce, I guess, a little bit. I wouldn't call myself a producer, but I can produce a, a bit. And uh, I write songs for artists, with artists, um, and anything and everything in between. Awesome. So can you talk to me a little about your journey from Northeastern to here? Sure. Yeah. Um, so I went to Northeastern from 2006 to 2010, uh, which seems a very long time ago. Uh, I was in the music industry program at the time, and I didn't set out to be a songwriter. I, I graduated and toured on my own as a singer songwriter for, for about five years, um, doing the college market, uh, playing clubs playing corporate gigs, playing living rooms, and, and doing about 100 to 150 shows a year. And I got to a point where I could either, you know, consider, uh, you know, continue to do the touring thing and try to level up and find a way uh, to make more money as a, as a singer songwriter, or, you know, get a record deal or, you know, try and just get like one notch above where I was, um, find something else in music or not do music at all. And, and I kind of gave myself a year runway to figure it out, not necessarily to have something concrete, but just to see if I was going in the right direction somewhere. And at that point, I was doing a show in New York at, at Rockwood Music Hall. I reconnected with a buddy who's actually a Northeastern grad, David Brooke. He was in the music program as well. Um, and he was a writer with UMPG, Universal Music Publishing Group at, at the time. And we had made music in, in college and, you know, lost touch as like some people do when everybody's kind of doing real life things. And he came out to a show and, and we had kind of had a moment where, you know, we were saying, why don't we, why don't we make some music together? I was living in upstate New York at the time. And he just told me to come crash his couch, 
for a week and we'd write songs and kind of see what happened. And, uh, you know, coming the one time turned into me going to New York, you know, once a month and eventually moving to New Jersey to be closer to New York. And then I met, uh, my, my manager who's in this chat, making sure I, I don't get out of pocket, uh, Rick Markowitz. And, uh, and then my first publisher, publisher Jeff Giese, who, who worked with BMG, was the first, um, first publisher that, and A&R that believed in me as a songwriter. Um, and eventually I did a, we did a deal with, with BMG and kind of you know, cut my teeth in, in New York making, making songs and trying to become a better songwriter. That's awesome. Um, first of all, gotta love Jersey. That's where I am right now. Of course. Uh, <laughs> can you tell us a little bit about what an average day looks like for you? And I'm talking a little bit more post or uh, post or pre pandemic, but what does a regular day look like in a songwriter job? Yeah, I mean, every day is different. I think um, boiling down songwriting, there's there's two types of sessions. The, the way that I look at it, there's a pitch session, which is when you're working with you know, another writer or writers and a producer or producers and the artist isn't in the room, but you're trying to pitch a song to an artist as an outside song. Um, and then there's the artist sessions where the artist is, you know, physically in the room and you're working with them to kind of like help see through their vision. Um, for me, like, you know, pre and post COVID, I, I usually do a lot of prep work going into sessions nowadays where I'll, I'll think through you know, concepts that I could bring to the table that day, chord progressions that I think could be interesting, listening to references if an artist sent over references, just to get a feel for sonically where they want to go. Um, but I guess it, it really depends on the type of artist that, that you work with, how long you're working with them for, um, as far as like what kind of prep work uh, I'll end up doing. Yeah. And can you talk a little about what those sessions are like? How long are they? Who's in the room? How many people? Sure. Um, how long are they? It's There's never like a set amount of time, really. Um, it's just, you know, however long people feel like going or however long it takes to write the song or, or to get an idea. I, I try not to put pressure on necessarily writing a, a full song in a day if if we don't feel like it's quite there. You know, as long as we start a good idea, I think that's a win, uh, first and foremost. Um, typically, though, they're, they're anywhere between, I don't know, like six to seven hours for like a pop session. Um, you know, working in Nashville, a lot of sessions end up being three to five hours. Typically, they're a little bit shorter. It's just they're like the people that work in country music are just so, so precise and so surgically fast at writing music. Um, and they, they end up doing doubles in a day where they have a session at 10 a.m. and their next session is at 4 p.m. Um, that they're just, they have to be quick. And it's like very much a numbers game to them. That's interesting. That's really cool. Yeah. So one of the questions we got was asking a little bit about your process when you're writing for an artist versus just writing a hit in general. So what's the difference when you're going in and you have an artist in mind versus you're going in and there's no artist that you're writing for specifically? Yeah, I mean, my philosophy working with an artist is is trying to help fulfill their vision, whatever that may be. And I think every artist is different. Um, so it's not like a one size fits all for how you approach, um, how you do an artist session. Um, and, and there's also different skill sets of artists. Some artists have a very clear perspective and, and know exactly what they want to say. And for me in those situations, as, as their co-writer and collaborator, I'm just there to, to help kind of sand the edges and, you know, be more of like an editor and, and make their concepts more concise and make things phonetically sound more pleasing, better. And then there's also artists that, you know, might not know exactly what their vision is or who they are, but they know what they do like and they don't like. So for me in that situation, I'd be a little bit more creative in just lobbing ideas at them. And they tell me, you know, do I like that? Do I not like that? Um, and then for pitch songs, I, I, my, my approach to, to pitch songs might not be the same as everybody. Um, you know, every, every writer is different. I try not to think necessarily let's, you know, going in, 
just for an example, like let's write a song for Jason Derulo. Cause I just don't like putting parameters on something that already has parameters when you're writing a song. I think it kind of like boxes in uh, an idea. And when you think of, if you're, if you're shooting at a really narrow target and you send that song to Jason Derulo's team, all it takes is one person to say no. And then you've just written a really specific song for Derulo that no longer worked for anybody. Uh, or anybody else that I'd rather just write a great song and have the right artists come and, and be able to cut it uh, when the time is right. Um, yeah. That's cool. Um, speaking of that, I know that you and I have talked before about one of your biggest songs originally kind of going back and forth on the artist a little bit. So can you talk to us about your experience with writing back to you by Selena Gomez? Sure. Yeah. Um, crazy, crazy experience that definitely changed my life and, and opened many doors and opportunities. Um, that song started, we wrote that song in, in uh, Brooklyn. I think that was fall of 2017, probably like end of September. It might have been right around when I was doing um, a talk at uh, Northeastern. It was right around that time that that happened. Um, Amy, it was with Amy Allen and... Um, trackside Parish, Parish Warrington and Diedrich Van Elsis is where it started. And Amy came in with kind of a, a skeleton of the, the beginning of the hook, just the melody. And we were all in agreement that, yeah, let's, let's chase down this idea. Uh, Amy and I kind of, you know, fleshed out the chorus and then uh, Parish and D trackside came up with that guitar part. And um, we wanted it to feel like, um, Green Day's Time of Your Life, that like just the, the nostalgic like feeling of that guitar, um, just that even that picking pattern just feels like really interesting and emotional. Um, we didn't like rip from that. It was just like we wanted something that felt felt like that. And um, honestly, the what took the longest because that that song came together fairly quickly. But what took the longest was landing, I think, on the title. We didn't have the title in mind, you know, as we were writing it. I think as, as a writer, sometimes you get in your own way of trying to make things more clever than they need to be and, and just write conversational lyrics. And it was right in front of us the whole time. And we thought it was too easy to call the song back to you. So we kept on trying to like find other ways to like make it land, but just back to you ended up feeling like the, the best and, and the right thing. And then, um, it kind of it kind of did its thing after that, which was which was crazy. And I think you know one little interesting note was I I, I remember that day that we wrote it, it, sitting on the couch with with Amy and just talking to her, being like, hey, this this will never happen. This is crazy, but because it was originally written as a duet, like Amy sang the first verse, I sang the second verse. And, you know, we both sang out the chorus. I was like, this would never happen, but this song would be the perfect song for, for Justin Bieber and Selena Gomez. And, uh, and then six months later, she ended up cutting the song. And then, you know, five months later after that, and a bunch of panic attacks from everybody's teams, we, we got the song out and it, it, was, a, it was a successful song. That's so cool. So when you cut a song like that for such a major artist, what happens to you? Like, what was your experience like in the next year after that? When when they cut it or when the song is released? When the song was released. When the song is released? Um, the, I mean, uh, the level of sessions that I started to get started to open up as far as like it was kind of leveling up. Um, I, I was still living in New Jersey at the time. I came out to LA, I think maybe the week before the song came out and or, or as the song was coming out and my first seven days of sessions were better than my last six years in, in in New York and that's not like a knock on New York it was just like a testament to having you know a song of that kind of magnitude what that could do and the kind of the kind of doors that opens um it also opened the door for me to to work in in Nashville and make country music I'm I'm a big country music fan, not in the, not like bro country, but just like good storyteller songwriting. Um, I really appreciate, and I think country music does it really incredibly well. And, and having like a, a song that's, you know, that does well at radio, that's just like a, a, a hit song in, in the pop format 
really helped to open the doors for me to kind of like jump the line and work with incredible writers and producers in Nashville. Yeah, I imagine that's so cool. Um, I think one of the things that a lot of people don't realize is the songwriting world is business in addition to art. And kind of the parallel to being an artist and getting a record contract is to work with a publishing company. So can you talk a little bit about what that means and what your experience has been with them? Sure, um, I guess in what, in what regard of, uh, of, of publishing and, and working with a publishing company. Yeah, well, for example, uh, you were signed with BMG for a little bit. So can you talk about what that meant for you on a day-to-day -day basis, like as a songwriter, how that changed things? Sure, yeah. I, I think it, it didn't necessarily change the way that I, I wrote. Um, it just brought infrastructure and a team around um, my day-to-day -day that, you know, I can write a song with, with another writer and a, and a producer and uh, send it to my A&R and you know, have an idea of, I think this could work for such and such an artist and they can send it to that artist, their team, their label, their, their management. And, and to just have people that are kind of your allies and that like sling songs for you and put you, put you into rooms that, you know, I think a and for uh, publishers are not only pitching songs, they're also trying to figure out combinations of people to put you in with. Um, whether it's an, another writer, whether it's another producer, whether it's an artist, like a big artist, whether it's an you know, on the cusp artist that they think are one song away, if it's like a baby developmental project um, artist that they think you, you should invest your time and energy into. Um, and a and just as much as uh, a manager, they wear, they wear many hats and they're basically your first line of defense as a, as a songwriter. That's awesome. And so exactly how does the deal work? Is this just you writing whatever songs you want and sending them over to them? Or is there a certain system in place that you have to write a certain amount of songs? Sure. I mean, every, every deal is different. So, you know, what my experience was isn't necessarily going to be indicative of what someone else's is. Um, I know previous deals, uh, back when people were, you know, buying physical albums, MDRC was a big thing. MDRC being you know, you have to write, say, for example, your MDRC is 300%. You have to have uh, a song is 100%. And say you and I write a song, I have 50%, you have 50%. That would be 50% towards my MDRC, which would bring it down to 250%. So you kind of have deliverables that you need to, uh, to, to, to deliver to your publisher in order to, you know, quote, unquote, recoup. Um, I think with, with my BMG deal, it, it was, I had to write a certain amount of songs. After, I don't remember what the, the deliverable was, but it's, you know, if you think about it, it makes sense that, you know, they're asking you to write and deliver 10 to 15 pitchable songs because they want to be able to, do, you know, if they're going to give you an advance, they want to be able to pitch your songs for you to make money and for the company to make money and make their money back and for everybody to, you know, to succeed. Um, and th I think that's pretty standard in, in deals. Awesome. Uh, we're already getting a bunch of really cool questions. So Angelica, Amazing. if you wouldn't mind letting Will Baker tap in to speak a little bit. Um, I think he had a pretty good question. Oh, cool. On mute. Okay. Uh, so my, uh, my question was just, uh, Basically, do, do you feel like songs have a shelf life, like whether it's a pitch song or an artist song, you know, is it like, oh, well, after five years, like, I'm just, I'm not going to pitch this. It's like too old or like, and then along those lines, I just wanted to ask, like, what's the oldest song that you've written, like from time of writing that you got placed? Yeah, um, I don't think songs have a shelf life necessarily. Um, you know, in, in country music, there's, there's songs that can sit around for years you know multiple years five to ten years and still get placed i think the tricky thing is in in pop that like typically you're going to have a production that is of a certain time and you know two to three years go by on a on a you know on a record a demo that you've you've passed around to other labels that have either passed on it or uh, an artist held it and then you know didn't end up working out production might not be as relevant and as contemporary as what, you know, what the trends are with, with production in that time. Um, 
I'm trying to think. I, I can't think of what's the oldest song I've had placed. Um, and, and there's there's no rhyme or reason to it either, really, when, you know, when a song gets cut. I've had songs that sit around for a couple of years that, you know, you end up forgetting about. Not, not out of, like, I don't love the songs, but, you know, you're always writing and creating songs in order to give yourself another shot at, you know, having, having big success. Um, probably like a couple of years, but I'm, I'm totally guessing on that. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you. Uh, great. Thanks so much, Will. Uh, Mikey, you brought up a great point about production. I know at the beginning you said you produce a little bit, but as a songwriter, how involved with you, how involved are you with the production that ends up in the final product? Um, I think it depends. Uh, I, you know, I play guitar. I, I'm like a guitarist that plays bass. Like I can play bass, you know, on the, the Tori Kelly record that came out, like I played bass on that record and, and guitar on that record. Um, you know, I can, I can get by, uh, I'm just, I'm looking to the side, I'm looking at my MIDI keyboard right here. Um, I can play the keys. Um, I can cut my own vocal. Um, I think it, it depends, it depends on what the session calls for or what, what the song calls for um i and if you're gonna label that i guess you could call me like an like an additional production or additional producer versus like a, a traditional um like outright producer okay cool i also have my mini right here so i like that we're on the same page with that. <laughs> yeah no one can see it <laughs> <laughs> Um, can you talk a little about the difference between when you write something from your perspective or writing from a different perspective? Because as mainly a songwriter, a lot of times the songs you are working on with other artists are from their perspective in their world. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I think I, you know, writing a pitch song, I think you kind of put on your, your own artist hat of just what feels authentic to you and emotionally true to you and um that's kind of how i approach pitch records in general and then hopefully you find the right artist that you know if that resonates with them as well in, in some regard even if what your intention was is somewhat different how they took it um working with artists you know i still am looking for for that emotional authenticity in myself so that i can like empathize with with the person that I'm working with and, and to be able to kind of channel my emotions to match their emotion and to be able to kind of like see their vision through but it, it's much more reliant on I, I might I try not to like infuse myself too much into someone else's perspective with working with an artist because I think it's just it's got to come from them at the end of the day and it's got to be true to them because they're the ones that are standing on stage and singing the song they're the ones with the you know the name and neon lights on uh, on a marquee that you gotta be you gotta be respectful to that yeah for sure and i imagine it can get a little difficult which is going to lead me to our second question so i'm going to give it over to rachel lipson if angelica you wouldn't mind letting her come in to ask a question um yeah so similar along the lines of what we were talking about earlier when we had asked you about how you sort of put yourself in the perspective of writing for a certain artist, how do you sort of put yourself in the shoes of, I guess you could say characters in a song? Like if you're writing a sort of like a storytelling song for country, for example, how do you put yourself in the shoes of someone else's perspective and then write about that? Um, that's a good question. I don't, I guess I don't really think about it at this point. You just kind of, it's like, you just do it. You, you kind of like just have, you, you put yourself in just like a kid's like imagination. To me, it's just like a playground of like trying to write songs and, and, you know, fitting puzzle pieces together of like making a song work. Um, and every day I get to wear a different hat. And that's, that's kind of just, I guess how I approach it is that like, I take, I try to take myself out of it in, in moments like that and just write it from almost like, you're writing us that you're just like a, a, a novelist or an author writing a story. You just have like creative writing basically at the end of the day. Oh, that's awesome. Thanks. <laughs> no, thank you. Great. Now we've talked about production a little bit. What other skills do you feel like are valuable for a songwriter? Maybe something that they wouldn't initially think of that have served you well. Um, 
I think in general is just always adding to your skill set. It's great to be great at one thing, but I think you become incredibly valuable when you're really good at multiple things. Whether, and as a writer, it's like, obviously you wanna be a good lyricist. You wanna be good with melodies. If you already play guitar, great. Learning how to play the keys, learning how to play bass, learning how to um, cut your own vocals or be able to cut someone else's vocals so that you could be, you know, you can get vocal production credit, vocal production fees, um, you know, being able to program drums um, and just taking initiative, I guess, in general is a, is a big thing. Um, only you are going to care the most about your career. I, I think, you know, you, you surround yourself with a team of people that really care about you and want you to succeed and, and want your vision to come true. But at the end of the day, only you are really going to care the most and you, and you should care the most about like what success is for you. Yeah, absolutely. You got to work for it. Yeah. Um, so on that same note, can you talk to a little bit about your experiences at Northeastern and maybe how some of those skills have helped you or any advice you have for current songwriters at Northeastern? Sure, yeah. Um, it's funny that Jim is in here. I don't know if everybody's had Jim Anderson as a professor. I learned a lot from, from Jim. And I think, you know, big thing for uh, skills that I learned along the way was taking, you know, recording classes with, with Jim learning how to cut vocals with him, learning how to wrangle musicians together to, you know, make demos. And my senior year, we made an EP in uh, Shulman Hall uh, and uh, with, with Jim and, and some of my good friends playing, playing uh, um, the instruments on, on the record. And uh, that definitely gave me confidence um, to be able to, you know, not be scared of using Pro Tools and, and not to be scared of, you know, cutting my, my own vocals. And uh, yeah, that was, that was definitely a great learning moment in, or just time at Northeastern. Um, I took a songwriting class with Peggy Seeger. Um, I think that was maybe junior year. Um, and, and that was more folk uh, songwriting, which isn't necessarily applicable, I guess, to, to pop music or, or relevant to pop music, but I think, and it's really hard to teach songwriting. I think it's it's just at the end of the day, you just do it. it, it you you write songs, and you can only teach so much that it, it's as far as what school can do is it kind of gives you the toolbox in order to kind of like have the template and the and the blueprint for you to build on, and then after that, you just kind of got to go out into the real world and it's trial and error, and you and you write a bunch of songs, you write some you know, incredibly bad songs, you write some good songs, and then you write some great songs, and then you figure out how or why you wrote a good song or a bad song or a great song and being able to differentiate the two. And then you just, you get better from there. And I think, I think Northeastern kind of gave me, you know, that basic template of, of understanding my business, being confident in you know, looking at contracts uh, on the business side of things and, and just being being able to speak the language and understand what's going on uh, on the business side of things. Um, so I think that's also just integral to any creative. I think at this point, it, it would be, you're doing yourself a disservice as a creative if you're not somewhat involved in your in the business side of your career. Um, you know, you, you should surround yourself with, with management that you trust with, you know, with an attorney that's a good attorney and that's got your back, but also you should kind of be aware of what's going on. You should, I read every contract that I get. Um, you know, there's things that I certainly don't understand that I'll ask my managers questions about or, or my attorney about and get clarification on, but just being, you know, cognizant of what's going on in your career. Cause again, you're the only person that's going to care the most about it and you should be as involved a as possible. Yeah, that's a really good point. That seems like a good policy for songwriters across the board. Um, next up, we're going to go to Isabella, uh, and she has a question as well. So if Angelica, you wouldn't mind. Hi there. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Great. Um, so I'm doing a research project right now in my music and genders class, and I specifically chose to research female uh, songwriters versus female singer-songwriters. Um, 
And I realized in my research that the current estimation of female songwriters is about 12%. Um, and when considering female producers and songwriters and people who work behind the scenes, it's about 47 to every one female. Um, I was wondering if you could talk about that discrepancy or what your experiences are um, in that yeah. female songwriter gap. Yeah, I mean, it's a bummer to hear the number out loud. Um, I think specifically with, with female producers, um, there just needs to be more female producers, point blank period. Um, and and it's, a, it's a matter of emboldening female writers and, and producers at an early age to keep writing and keep doing it. And it, this is like, it kind of gets it just like a bigger societal issue, I think, but like, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if music, music industry is a boys club. It probably inherently is. Um, in, in my experiences, I, I typically like to work with, if there's another co-writer, I usually like having at least one female writer or female in the room. Cause I think it's necessary, you know, to have a female perspective in, in a song just to like balance things out. And, and I think, you know, uh, moving forward in, in 2020, it, it's just like having representation in rooms is important. You know, like you don't want to have a Katy Perry song that's written by five dudes. I just don't, it's just like, we don't need another one of those. I mean, it, it, there, it's gonna happen, but like, I think you just have to make conscious efforts and that, that goes to, you know, me, that goes to publishers, that goes to managers, artists, that making sure that you put, you know, female writers in the rooms and, and, and just embolden them to, to create and, and to make great stuff. <laughs> that was a great question. Awesome. Thank you for that. Um, before you were talking a little bit about the different skills that you have overall, and one of the things is melody and lyrics. Now, I think kind of one concept that a lot of us sort of get familiar with is there are sort of more um, lyrical and idea writers and more melody writers. I think you're pretty good at both, but would you say you tend to be towards one category? And if not, do you tend to start with melody or start with lyrics or just start with both? Yeah, um, I think when I started writing, I was much more melody driven because I was just a good singer and a bad writer. Um, and it just it just took me <laughs> writing a bunch of bad songs to figure out why I was writing bad songs and just getting in getting into rooms and learning from better writers. You know, starting off in, in New York, uh, someone that really helped me figure out how to become a good pop writer is Scott Harris. And Scott is, is um, Sean Mendez is right hand man. he does everything, everything with Sean. He has, and Scott has like a bunch of hits outside of Sean, but he really kind of like taught me structure and, you know, always starting with a chorus with a song when you're writing a pop song, really? um, just because that's, when you think about it, you know, the chorus is basically the summary in an essay and, and the concept is the thesis if you want to like boil it down that way like educationally um and for me i'd always kind of started writing with the verse and just like kind of go with the flow stream of consciousness and i ended up writing bad choruses because it was just like i would write a great verse i was like this is amazing i have to beat this next part in the pre and then i was like i feel great about the pre now i have to beat that part and write an amazing hook and it's just like, why, why not your, your first instinct typically, I think on a song melodically or with an idea is probably going to be your best one. So starting with the hook is just something that I always try to hammer home. And like, not every song works the same way. Sometimes you'll, you'll write a verse before, but typically I'll start with the hook and then kind of work my way backwards. Cause it's, then I kind of know what we're writing about and writing towards. Um, and then as far as do I start with melody or, or lyric first, I'm, I'm much more concept driven. Um, I, I just like knowing, I think in pop, everybody is good at melodies that if you don't have a good lyric to support the melody, it kind of doesn't matter. Um, so trying to figure out what are we writing about? What are we trying to make somebody feel? What do I feel? What do these chords make me feel? 
and building a uh, building a concept around that and then having the melody match that emotion and the lyric um, is is typically where I find the most success in writing a great song and it's it's different for for different genres as well you know with country music it's it's very like heavily lyric driven and, and melody is like very much on the back burner with you know writing writing something like an r b song it's much more on the mic and, and much more stream of consciousness um so like every genre different is different I, i'm i'm kind of like speaking in terms of uh, of pop music and, and i guess my philosophy in general i know some writers are very melody based and they'll they'll only get the sketch of the melody first and then you'll try and make the lyrics phonetically hit what the melody is doing that's really cool i feel very called out because i always start with verses and then my courses are not as good so i'm <laughs> Listen, gonna go write a song tomorrow let's, let's <laughs> no there's there's see there's no right or wrong way to write a song it's just if if that worked for you you know amazing and if you feel like you're getting a good quality song amazing um to me, I've, and cause I used to, I used to write like that as well. And sometimes I will start with the first, um, if I'm just like stuck, but I've just found just a higher batting average starting with the hook. It just makes, it makes like the verses fall into place a lot easier when I know exactly what I'm trying to say and how I'm trying to get there. Yeah, absolutely. I think Sam Rosario, we can bring him in because he had a great question about hits in general and all that kind of stuff too. Hello, my name is, oh, well, my apologies. <laughs> um, oh, I'm actually in a public space, but um, I'd love to ask, yeah, because I learned about it in my recording three class. I work with Prince Charles Alexander. He's a recording engineer that worked with Biggie Smalls back in the day. And he talks a lot about mixing and having that mixing mind as sort of a production mind as well. And when it comes to that production mind and making, producing these like really good songs, you know, it's a lot of like the hit formula tends to focus around the downbeat of the rhythm. So if you're ever like writing a melody or if you just have chords, like are you thinking of making the rhythm of like your main hook melody like form around the downbeat, whether you're like, you start like singing right on the downbeat or you sing on like the upbeat and it leads to the downbeat. Do you ever think about like how that subdivision like starts on the downbeat? Yeah, I mean, in, in pop music, I definitely think about it a little bit more than I would in, in other things, just because pop is so much more structured, I think. Um, I'm, I'm not like kind of what you're talking about or, or like what, I've, what I'm kind of drawing is, is also like, um, like a lot of the Swedes, like, like Max Martin, they really subscribe to melodic math. Um, and it's so much driven, like, uh, for an example, like not, not to get into like theory too, too much, but it's, it's like, if your verse starts off the one and your pre starts on the one in order for the chorus to feel different from the verse and the pre, you might want to pick up into the one in the chorus. Um, it's same with where you start the melody. Usually you, you want your highest point of the melody to be in the chorus. That's not like a like a hard and true, like that has to happen every single time. Um, and, and I don't necessarily subscribe to the melodic math religiously. I'm definitely aware of it and subconsciously doing it when when I'm writing a song. And, and I think the more that you write, the more that you become aware of, you know, cadence patterns. And just like, if the verse is flowy, maybe you want more of an open pre-chorus and then maybe the chorus is a, a bit more rhythmic than the other sections also to make rhythmically each section feel different um again there aren't really like these are like unwritten rules and it's not necessarily that you have to use these parameters either it's like at the end of the day it's it's what feels good and what makes you feel something and what makes the people that you're working with feel something and, and something that you're excited about That's awesome. Thanks, Sam, for that. Um, would you mind taking us through one of your songs and kind of showing us a little about what you thought in one place, why you chose this lyric, why you chose this melody? Sure, yeah. I will play, um, let's see. I'll play the, the Tori Kelly song, Unbothered. Sure, got, okay, sick. I'll play it and then I'll just kind of talk about it after. 
share. Okay, cool. All right. Uh, bothered, babe. I've been feeling brand new. I don't know what, but I do. I'm winning, minding my business. No time to stop and start thinking about you. Ooh, 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 ooh. Don't think about you. Nah, you. Ooh, 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 ooh. Don't think about you. Lately, it hits a bit different. Realize the wave I've been missing. I let it get too deep. Let it get too deep. Now I'm living blissfully. So you get the idea. Um, that song w I wrote with uh, a writer, Chloe George, um, and Jorgen Odegaard, a producer, um, both in both in LA. We did this song last August, I want to say, or maybe September. And I had been listening to um, Justin Timberlake's uh, 2020 Experience. It's like one of my favorite Justin Timberlake albums, and. Uh, the one, one song that I love on that album is Push Your Love Girl. And I'd been listening to it a bunch the night before. And I was like, we should just write a song with that kind of like feel, that kind of groove. It's kind of like funky. And um, kind of use that as a reference point of just like, let's do something that feels like that. It just feels good. And uh, Jorgen started to make the groove. Um, I made, I just laid down bass and then like a guitar part. And then we started with the hook. Um, Chloe came up with that unbothered, like that little run, because she's a ridiculous singer. Um, she came up with that with that melody. And we're like, yep, that's the hook. And then started to work our way backwards and, and wrote um, the verses. And my favorite part of the song in that, in that song is the pre. That it's like this just beautiful, like flowy, ascending melody that you know, rises above what the chorus ends up being, but it's just like, you're kind of like going up a mountain then you're just landing on a pillow when you get to the chorus. Um, that was just, I just remember having so much fun uh, writing that song that day. We didn't have anybody in mind when we were writing it. We just wanted to write a good song. And um, you know, it ended up being something that I'm, I'm really proud of. It didn't, it didn't perform the way that I think we expected it to, which is just another kind of, um, teachable moment in, in having expectations for how a song can perform. And uh, a lot of that is out of your control as a writer and as a producer, and you kind of have to be okay with that. And um, just enjoy a win, like having a song come out as a songwriter is like a crazy accomplishment in and of itself. Um, but yeah, I'm really, really proud of that record and, and always will be. Yeah, it's definitely a cool one. I, I like the poeticness of the going up the mountain in the pillow. <laughs> yeah. Definitely the, the lyric and the concept in you. Um, so when you say uh, you were maybe surprised by how it performed, are you the sort of person who walks into a room and says, yes, we just wrote a hit? Or is that something that you don't really know? Can you have an idea? <laughs> like when you write these songs, what are your thoughts on them at the moment? Yeah, um, I kind of get triggered when someone says, like, we're, let's write a hit today. because. I have no idea what a hit is. Um, and I don't think anybody can kind of pinpoint what a hit is. They can, you can say what, what a hit feels like or what a song feels like, or, or, you know, we wrote something great that day, but, you know, a hit is so, has so much to do with like the commercial success of a song and not the actual like writing of a song. Uh, my approach to writing is just write the best song that we can that day and write something that makes makes you feel something um whatever that means and, and i think you know the landscape of what the music business is and, and just like recorded music and and the stuff that's coming out you can look at top 40 you can look at the billboard hot 100 and the records are all over the place and and records are breaking on on TikTok, and they're be you know they're now like TikTok records are translating to records that stream incredibly well on Spotify, and then 
labels end up wanting to sign these acts when they see that the numbers are crazy and then, you know, they take certain songs to radio. I mean, I think Arizona Zervas is a really good example of, of an artist that had a record, Roxanne, that, that just blew up on TikTok. And then that translated to Spotify and then that translated to radio um, incredibly well. And, and, and a more, you know, current example of that, uh, like today is like um, 24K Golden and Ian Dior, uh, the song Mood, that's number one at radio right now. You know, that's, it, you don't, it kind of comes out of nowhere. And that, that song blew up on TikTok. I think that's what's like, that was the initial push of that song. Um, but I don't think when they write those songs, they're like, we wrote a hit. Maybe they do, but I certainly don't do that. I'm just like, we, we just wrote a dope song that I'm super proud of. And like, who knows what's going to happen with it, but it, it makes me feel good. That's so cool. Have you noticed a change at all? Like, are people starting to write for that 15 second TikTok hook? Or is that just kind of when it happens, it happens? Um, I think some people are, um, and that even, that even speaks to, you know, people writing to the Spotify algorithms to get playlisting. I just think that's like a bit short-sighted to me. It's like, you just write something great, write something with intention. That's great. And people will listen to it regardless of whatever Spotify algorithm and whatever playlist thing. And it like, you can't really create a TikTok hit. It just kind of happens. I think you can't, you can't really manufacture that. Um, I, there are people that definitely make TikTok like sound alike records where they just like, there's little tricks that people do in order to get people's attention. But I, I don't really go for that because I'm not really trying to chase trends. What I, what I try to do is like, I want to make culturally relevant records and, you know, stuff that creates trends that hopefully people use my stuff as as um, references that's awesome um at this point i think we should head over to eli because he also had a pretty good question but okay. everyone keeps sending your questions because they're great and i'm getting texted a bunch so i appreciate it hi um so my question was are there like certain pitfalls that you see like beginner or even like advanced songwriters fall into often that you wish you could just like grab them scream them scream at them saying <laughs> stop doing this you know yeah 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 uh that's a good question I, I think in a very broad sense is just like don't look at what other people are doing and that's just like just worry about you do the work you know put your head down and write great shit and you know the people that are meant to, you know, come around you and support you will, will come around and support you. It's not going to happen when you're looking at another writer or a producer or an artist on, and you're looking on, on Instagram or on Twitter or just like on any sort of social media and you're seeing people be in, in sessions or uh, in rooms that you wish you could be in and you're wondering why you can't be in those rooms or why they, they are getting these opportunities that you're not getting or, you know, if, if uh, writers are getting cuts with artists that you're like they don't deserve that or whatever it's just like you know your journey is your journey worry about you and, and there's room for everybody to succeed and, and your time to shine will happen when it's meant to happen but that only happens if if you put your head down and and do the work you have to do the work and write great stuff for people to want to you know be attracted to your writing um and, and just be a good person i can't stress enough that like at the end of the day, you know, there's a lot of people that are talented as songwriters. There's, you know, within a margin of error, everybody's pretty good. It, you know, some are better than others. Some are less, less good than others, but everybody's talented to a certain point. And it's so, it becomes so much more about personalities and, and, and just like inherently being a good person and like following a good moral code. Um, goes a really long way. I'm a pretty firm believer in that. Awesome. Uh, I think we're just going to keep going. So next, I'm going to hand it over to Ryan, who has a question as well. Hey, so can you guys hear me? <laughs> hey. Ryan Schmidt. What's up, man? What's going on, man? Looking good. Looking good. Me too. I All like right. the stash. You know, I'm trying, trying my best. <laughs> All right. Um, for songwriters, well, in the COVID world, it's pretty funny. When I take off the mask, it 
Yeah. <laughs> freaks people out all right so for uh songwriters new uh to one of the music towns uh new york la nashville and to a lesser extent um atlanta or maybe even miami what's the best way to for songwriters to form relationships with reps at their pro yeah that's a good that's a good question um this would all be i guess pre-covid um or post-covid it to me it's just um, I know BMI and ASCAP, I, I don't know, I, I'm assuming CSAC does similar things. BMI and ASCAP are the ones that come to mind that um, they do networking events with, with writers. Um, when I was newer in New York, they had like blind dating for, uh, for songwriters where you would just meet other, other writers, you would play each other music. And if you liked each other's music, you would exchange information and, you know, maybe work with them down the line or not work with them, just be friends with them. Um, I'm assuming that'll happen post, you know, post pandemic, post COVID. Um, and then beyond that, I, I mean, they, I think BMI has like general emails that you can reach out to in each office in, you know, uh, New York, Nashville, London, LA, Miami, you know, um, pretty much everywhere. Uh, whether, I don't know if they respond to them, but I know that they have the emails. I think it's just taking initiative and putting yourself out there. Um, and and whether that's an email i'm sure they have phone numbers i don't know if people are in office whether it gets forwarded to somebody um they at least have numbers that you can definitely call um and just reaching out to to your friends in in the community that you're in that may or may not be involved in in the music community you never know if you never ask um and again, that goes back to just taking initiative. Um, but as far as as far as the PRO reps go, um, I know pre pre and post pandemic, they do networking events where you can meet reps, where you can meet other writers, and um, that's something that I did early on in New York. Um, and I eventually met Sam Cox and Brooke Morrow, who are in the, the New York office and with, with BMI. And they are, you know, amazing people. And, and I'm super, super grateful for them. They kind of changed my life and my career um, as a PRO. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, man. Great. So I think our last one we're going to do for now, I'm going to hand it over to Kala, who had an amazing question as well. Um, so yeah, Hello. my question. Um, my question was for songwriters or music industry students who are nearing graduation. Um, what is your best piece of advice on how to get into the industry as a recent grad, especially from Northeastern? Yeah, I, uh, are you a songwriter? Were you saying that as a songwriter? Okay, sick. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it seems cliche to say, but like, I think figuring out, you know, where you know, physically you want to be, um, it would be good, ideal, I think, to be close to New York or to LA or to Nashville or London or Miami or Atlanta, um, being close to one of those hubs, just because that's where a lot of creatives are in general. And you'll have, you know, good success linking up with people um, and, and writing with, with other, you know, with peers. And that's where PRO reps are. Um, that's where, um, you know, publishers are, labels are in New York and LA and Nashville. Um, and some in, some in Atlanta. Um, beyond that, it's just, I think, you know, just continue to write songs, keep on creating and just keep on getting better at your craft, listening to, listening to music that you love. I'm constantly listening to music where I'm just trying to figure out, you know, the songs that I like, why I like them, how I like them, and just like breaking them down and how to like kind of apply it to my skill set and just taking that into sessions. It's just, yeah, just, just honing your craft and then you know, finding a place where you want to move as a songwriter, figuring out if the, if you want to pick a lane, whether like what type of music you enjoy, you know, creating, I think, you know, figuring that out and figuring out if you know anybody from Northeastern or from, you know, just life that you've encountered making music with, if you play shows, just hitting those people up, you know, and just putting yourself out there. And it's just, I think early on, it's, it's so much about just saying yes, to a lot of opportunities because you never know what's going to happen. And it's also a good time to kind of 
figure out the you know the people that you do like working with the people that you don't like working with you know figuring out good sessions versus bad sessions and then hopefully you end up building out a creative community and crew of people that you love and that you know that doesn't happen overnight that takes a good amount of time obviously um but but yeah i think uh, hopefully that's some somewhat of an answer i don't know <laughs> It really sounds like connections are super important. Um, I know you mentioned the BMI, but are there any other connections that you'd recommend people going for or connections that have served you well in your time? Um, I mean, I, there's definitely, I mean, people from even Northeastern, um, there's, uh, there's like plenty of alums uh, on this, on this Zoom. Uh, that, that I was friends with or am friends with that still work in, in music business. It's just like, I think it's maintaining, you know, relationships and friendships from, from college, from, from high school, whatever. You never know what, where someone's going to end up being. And, and as far as all of this is like handicapped by, you know, the fact that this is COVID and we're in a pandemic, I'm thinking outside of that, when we do start doing, you know, networking events or just hangs with other people is just like, I guess putting yourself out there, being, you know, being authentic, being genuine, not trying to like uh, look for something out of, out of somebody and what they can do for you is just genuinely like trying to create and, and, and nurture a relationship with somebody that's, you know, mutually beneficial to you both. Absolutely. Very well said. So our last question is one we've gotten a lot and it's a lot of songwriters, I think, like you said, you have to differentiate between a good song and a great song and they might struggle to do that. They might be looking for feedback. So what kind of advice do you have for them? To figure out the difference between a good song and a great song? Yes, and then also if they're just looking for feedback in general. Sure, yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's just, it's super subjective. Uh, and like, you know, take what I say with a grain of salt, obviously. Um, you know, like, I'm not here to say that I'm any sort of expert other than, you know, this has been my journey as a, as a songwriter. And I have like certain tools and I've written a certain amount of songs and I've had like a certain amount of success. I'm not where like I would love to be. I'd like, I'd love to have more, you know, commercial success. Obviously there's certain tools that, that I use that I, that help me identify in my mind, what I think is a good versus a great song. Um, I think the only way to do that is to write more personally. It is just the only way that you're going to understand, you know, why a great song is a great song is by writing a thousand songs. Cause then you realize, Oh, I wrote some like clunkers and I wrote some songs that are, are okay. But for whatever reason, you know, they don't hit the mark for me or for, you know, if I pass it around to people, they just, it just didn't get, it didn't get cut. Um, and then, um, I know you, we, we've been talking about, you know, having, having people submit music if we, if we wanted to segue into that. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> um, so if you guys did not get your question answered or you have more questions, please don't worry because Micah has generously said that he will come back, um, in the spring. And in addition to doing that, he is willing to listen to some demos. So Micah, I'm not sure if you want to talk a little bit about what you're looking for, but we're all super excited. Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, you haven't, you made a, like a separate Gmail account to, to submit songs. And basically it's just, um, I, I'm not a producer. So I would say if you're, if you're sending songs, um, don't worry about the production level. You can send something that you're excited about. Ideally uh, just send a song. Um, just because if there's a bunch of people sending stuff for me to be, I want to be able to listen to, to, to listen to everything and to give, thoughtful notes to, to people. Um, that's tough to do if, if people are sending two, three, four songs. So just, just, just one song that you feel excited about. It's not make or break but by any means. It's just, you know, uh, if, if you're just, if you want any sort of feedback that, or, you know, critical, uh, critical feedback that's going to help you in any sort of way, just with like having a stranger's ears hear it and give you, give you some honest, uh, an honest opinion about what they think. Um, yeah, and I just want to, I, I would love to hear stuff that, that everybody's like pumped about, not something that you think I would want to hear, um, just something that you, you love and that you're passionate about. And um, I think one, one good thing would be to know if it's uh, a song that you're ideally looking to pitch 
to something uh, to pitch to another artist or whether the song that you're sending is for you yourself as an artist. Cause I think my feedback would probably be different depending on um, what that answer was. Um, just because like an artist song is, I don't know, it's, I guess it's different to, to critique someone's art versus uh, someone sending around a pitch song. I'd be, it's, it's much easier for me to kind of send uh, a critical feedback on, on a pitch song because you tend to know what a and r's and and artists and, and managers are looking for yeah 100 percent. so to everyone who's interested i put the email in the chat but it's songwriting review neu at gmail.com so please just send one song that's the audio file again it doesn't need to be anything super produced but if you can do that awesome and then accompany that with a lyric sheet would be a big help yes um, yes yeah, so if you guys could send those in by January 15th is kind of our rough deadline. If you want to send them in earlier, I think that'd be super helpful to Micah. Um, and then our goal is to select a few of them and maybe listen back to them at the next session. You know, if they're really good, if there's an area that can um, be a teachable moment, I think you said, Micah. So just yeah. all these different ways to kind of learn from each other. Yeah, um, I just want to take a second to, to thank you, Tim, and, and Craig for, you know, helping kind of spearhead this whole thing. I know Tim and I have, have talked a bunch. Uh, we've done a few interviews now, I think. Uh, and I wanted to kind of be a resource for, for you and for other, you know, songwriting students at, at Northeastern, um, knowing, you know, being a music industry student there, there wasn't necessarily a, a writer um, that was in the field like I was at the time. And, and I just want to be somebody that can be like a sounding board or just, you know, to be able to like mentor and educate in any sort of way. And, and this by no means is going to be a one-time thing. You know, we're already planning on doing something in the spring on Zoom. And it's, you know, something that I would intend to do, um, you know, once a semester. Um, ideally, you know, as long as, as long as we can and as long as there's uh, people that are down to, to do these, to, to, to join in. And hopefully after the pandemic's over, I'd love to come to Boston and do, you know, another panel talk discussion, you know, hang out in the studio and, and get to meet, uh, meet some of you guys and, and girls. And um, I just want to thank you guys for, you know, for spending the time and, and listening to me gab and just ramble. <laughs> um, hopefully this was insightful in, uh, in some shape or form. Uh, but yeah, this was, this was a, a trip. This was amazing. Thank you so much. Every time I hear you speak, I learn so much. So I really appreciate that. I'm sure everyone on this call really appreciates you coming, you taking the time to speak with us and to teach us what you know. So a big thank you to you, Micah, as well as the Northeastern Co-op Department, uh, the CAMD Music Department, and of course, our co-sponsors at the Songwriting Club. So everyone, thank you so, so much for coming. I hope you had a great time. Remember to send your song in and yeah, have a great night. Take it easy, guys. Thank you, Micah.